I think it says that we are recording here. Hi, welcome to the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. My name is Lewis Ezrin, and I'm joined by my friend Steve Nutter. How you doing, Steve? Hey, Lewis. I'm doing wonderful here in uh, January 2022. Glad to be spending time with you and everybody in our lovely CRT community, mm. <laughs> which is... Uh, it's just been a lot of fun so far this year. I got some interesting things to talk about from projects to just regular life. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I'm glad to be glad to be here today. How about you? Okay, man. I'm, do I'm doing good. It's been a bit of a tough week, but we got through it. Uh, got on got on with with life as we need to do. Uh, yeah, so I think for everyone listening today, uh, today we've sort of just got a what to say a big mix of topics. There's no one overarching theme. There's no one overarching advice on CRT. So sort of like changing the topic each time. Sometimes it'll be just like a, a slab of CRT info. Sometimes it's just us talking. Sometimes it's random. Uh, so yeah, today we're just going to talk about the general topics that we've had going on in the last week. We'll put that in the description and, uh, yeah, just have fun. We appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, so many nice comments on YouTube. I really uh, appreciate that people are listening and getting into it and enjoying it. Yeah. I think it's, as it's, uh, I'm, I'm having more fun and fun each time we get a chance to do this. And, <laughs> yeah. um, it's good. It's good to get some questions and, but it's also good to just, you know, relax and, and talk about, uh, just, you know other things than always CRT stuff, but it's great to have a place, of course, to come in and talk about the things in the CRT um, world, mm -hmm. which you know are ever changing. And uh, it's kind of funny that we're even talking about that because the last like week and a half, I've not even been working on a CRT. Yeah. I've been working on that LCD screen um, when I've had chances. Which you and I have been uh, kind of struggling here to get this episode recorded. Here we would mm. normally do these on Tuesday. We're like six days past that because of uh, multiple snowstorms at least for me i know for you're you, used yeah to you it. got a lot of snow you used to it out in uh out in estonia in Europe, yeah i mean it's not here, it's not easy but we know how uh, yeah, it goes yeah. well but here it's been uh, okay, kind of funny been, yeah so the kids have been home from school and sort of yeah, got to do more yeah. around the so house so the kids stuff. have been home from school and that means they need a lot of entertaining <laughs> <laughs> and um so that's, you know, that's that's taken uh, some time away from when I can normally get to do stuff. But that's OK. It's kind of good to have them around and see them around when they're young. There's still a lot of fun to go out and play with in the snow. Yeah, um, but nice. it's kind of funny. You know, we had two we had two different snowstorms happen uh, kind of almost simultaneously after one another. So mm -hmm. the first one came and it was almost like uh Oh, there's going to be snow. And we're like, yeah, right. It was like 65 degrees the day they're saying this. Mm -hmm. And then the day before that. Oh, and this is the even better kicker on this list. So my kids just got done with their, their Christmas and New Year's break. And the first day that they're scheduled to finally go back to school, we get this letter saying, oh, no school tomorrow. We're like, what? <laughs> you know, it's 65 degrees. I got to get these kids out of here. Right? We're all ready to send them back. And then... They're like, no, it's going to be snow. And I was like, yeah, right. And then I woke up the next morning. It was like six or seven inches on the ground. So that's a lot of snow in a short period of time. And the mm. temperature dropped well below freezing. Um, so the first snowstorm hits. And I actually have kind of a funny thing where, um, well, it's not, not entirely funny. But so there's a pretty serious, you know, interstates through our state. One that leads into the capital, uh, Washington, D.C., from Richmond, the capital of the state of Virginia. So the stretch of highway was just pummeled uh, for a couple of hours with snow. And if you were unfortunately on that stretch of highway, that the roads both ways just closed. And it closed for 30 hours. Dang. So people were stuck in their car for 30 hours on the interstate. Now, thankfully, no, you know, nothing happened. That's mm -hmm. why... Um, and it's cold. The governor was That's like, oh, point. you know, don't worry. No, why were those? Why were they out there anyway? Why you were know, they driving on the road? Right. It's like, why come would on, you man. do that? Why were you driving on the road? But then it was really funny because there's another guy who's a senator uh, and he got stuck on the highway <laughs> for 27 hours. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, it's good that you can laugh about it, that nobody was hurt. But it's it's the same time. It's like how in a modern society, how terrible would that be to be stuck in your car for 30 hours? In especially the snow, if you had in the cold. especially if you had like one of those new fancy electric vehicles and it just like shut off or you know, how can it yeah what do you do there it, you freeze your butt off in the car so 
Uh, that was were people getting like storm? food delivery. Some guy on a bike maybe yeah, to make right? it by or. S- well, s- no, I think that anybody bike. was like, I don't want to go near that. Even like that's what I said. Like even the state workers, I don't want to go near that area. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, that was the first one, and then the kids, of course, were out Monday and Tuesday from that, and it started to taper off, and they clean up the roads, and they went back to school Wednesday, and Thursday, and then Thursday night, boom, another snowstorm <laughs> hits, and uh, no school Friday, and tomorrow is we're recording this Sunday. Tomorrow is Monday. Hopefully tomorrow. Uh, I don't think that there's going to be any more snow. It's actually supposed to warm up beyond above freezing and mm. uh, should melt off a good portion of things and then rain. But that's okay, been that. kind of what's going on uh, around here. You know, it's just just weather interrupting things mm. when uh, when yeah, I wouldn't have thought that that would have happened. But uh, Dude, at I least not that, the highway closure. But so it's like that random thing, like that once or twice a year or once or twice uh, every couple of years, you get this huge dump. And of course, no one knows how to deal with it, because if it happens once every year, once every two years, you don't have the trucks. You don't have the, I don't know, the scrape it off. You don't have yeah. those Mr. Plow who comes along. You don't have little like we I mean, we would have a, a dump like that. And then <laughs> the guy comes in, <laughs> takes it all away. There's some dude scraping. It, it's clean sort of five hours later um, or as much as possible, even though the side of the road is piled high around here oh so yeah we get that, a bit that more, was I another guess. issue i live on a you know a client uh, my driveway is steep and mm. uh, my old white my old white cop car looking sedan or i don't even know if you call it a sedan it's about sedan? twice yeah. as long as one <laughs> the old uh grand marquee i would try to pull it up the driveway and just go <laughs> slide backwards and i was like all right so i had to park down by the street but like you said the plow <laughs> comes through it buries my car three or four <laughs> times in just all the snow. And I'm like looking at it, I'm like, oh, I don't even want to go down walk to that thing, much less drive in it. Uh, right, but yeah, it it's out. just a funny thing. is like here, they're actually, in Virginia, they're kind of used to it. So like you say, at least in my area, that's what they, they were plowed within a couple oh, of hours. Yeah. And oh, nice. then, but I didn't understand about it. That's why I was like, well, it's just kind of shocking that the highway wouldn't have been. But they were, at mm. least in our area, they did that. Um, so it was that, but yeah, you instantly get all that slushed and like the, ba- the driveway has a mountain in front yeah. of it that you have to like plow through just to get to the road. Uh, but I did, I did live in Portland, Oregon, uh, about, let's see, it was 2006 and 2007 and they had a colossal snowstorm like, you know, this, that they're not used to, not at all. Surprisingly, that area is, uh, it's it's a valley and it's secluded by the west coast mountains kind of so it's in a valley and even though it it gets chilly it never really gets below or it doesn't get below freezing that often and it also doesn't get highly hot it's just kind of like in this valley that stays this temperature well they had a snow front come in and just dump this kind of snow on them and it was the craziest thing i've ever seen because they said that the city of portland at this time had i think two snow plows and that was Portland, and that's like the whole area yeah. was relying on two snowplows, so there was nothing. They went around, closed off like half the roads, and uh, so we were just sitting home and you know watching the news, watching people just try to react. I'll never forget one clip was a guy, and this was like one of the first cell phone videos that I remember seeing, and it was somebody in downtown Portland, which is a very hill. It's on a hill, which is a steep hill too, and uh, this poor guy was in his car, at the top of the hill and the whole downhill road was covered in ice and there's cars parked on each side right and somebody's filming him from their like apartment building and Mm. watching this poor guy and he's got his window down and he's going like two miles an hour down this hill (laughs) and then he just starts to slide to the right and he bangs against a car and then bangs against the car like slow motion banging against about four cars and then on the guy's cell phone clip you can hear him saying help me help me and it's like what are you gonna do dude and so he just keeps doing this on this slow procedure and he hit 14 vehicles and his car <laughs> finally stopped in the in the lobby of a coffee shop so i was like i could not latte imagine. please <laughs> yeah i was like i could not imagine being that guy's insurance adjuster mm. wait a second you hit 13 vehicles going two miles an hour and a, a coffee shop yeah. So I'm sure he had a bad day, but that was uh, that was like a snowstorm that completely messed up the city. I mean, nobody moved 
and and it was like funny. It went up to Seattle, and they had the same issues. Just not some areas are just not used to that snow. Right. If you're so, not used to it, it's it's tricky. I've had there was about the same actually a bit after you, but similar. I was about ten, twelve years ago. I was living in Helsinki, Finland, just north. And um, in in Helsinki, where I was living in the center, no free parking. So if I want to park my car for an extended period, I got to drive it outside of the ring road. If you're in Helsinki, you know you got to be outside of the ring. And uh, I found this one, I don't know, one little neighborhood. I could get a bus back easily. And I was going to Australia for like six weeks uh, then. So I parked it on the side of the road. And when I came back, I mean, it was just encased. The, 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 every day, the, the, thing, the whole thing's encased in snow. And I had to somehow dig through to the... No, no, no. I had cleverly kept the shovel. That's right. I knew I'm like, something's going to happen. So I kept the shovel and I had to put some dings on my car that day trying to oh. get through. So I dug the car out of the snow and maybe those people in that neighborhood had recognized me because the other thing that had happened, what I also would do is uh, I, I would cycle there. I could probably cycle there in about 20 minutes. And so what I would do is, because I didn't have any money then, I'd cycle to where my car was, lock my bike, drive around, do my errands, drive back, cycle home. And someone had tried to fuck with the lock on my bike. Someone had tried to steal it in the meantime and they hadn't done a very good job. It just basically screwed the lock. <laughs> so what I eventually had to do was it was just a street sign, like a pole with a, a sign. So I thought, well, how am I going to do here? So I, I got a, a high-vis vest, a reflective vest, because you know you can do anything if you've got a high-vis vest on. No one's going to question you. So I put a high-vis vest on and I went and I, I got a little step ladder. I undid the, the sign at the top, vunk, and then it was just a pole. So I took the whole bike whoop, off the top, took that off. And then, to my credit, as if anyone was watching, I don't know, I just put the sign back on. Put the sign back on. Left. I was willing to explain myself to the police if they come. No problems. I've done everything. I'm just a practical guy. And then I could put the bike in the car, took it home, got the angle grinder. That deals with it like butter. Um, that's why I have an angle grinder. If you ever... Like, yeah, even last summer I had to do it like right out front of my workplace and you just, no one questioned. Like if you roll in with such a bold statement, which is I have a big electric, like electric powered angle grinder in the middle of the day in front of everyone, steal a bike. No one's going to know. No, like that, it's so blatant. No one's going to question you if you do it with high vis in the middle of the exactly. day. Exactly. I think, I think you hit it the nail on the head if you're dressed for the part, right? So if you're wearing all it really needs to be is an orange or yellow reflective safety vest. Yep. Because if you go out there with a piece of machinery and you're grinding or you even screw it on a, a pole, hmm. eventually somebody's like, oh, you look like crazy. But if you're wearing that, no one even questions it. It doesn't even have to say anything on it. It could just say, it could be something that comes with your, uh, you know, a joke kit, a exactly. Halloween costume. You just have to dress up like the Beastie Boys and you can go right. around and do whatever you People want. People just don't question. I think at Ghostbusters, wasn't it two that they proved that by going in the sewers by just putting it on and jumping right. over there in the yeah. sewer? They did the same thing. Yeah, it's it's because like you say, if you're just out there and you're like, oh my gosh, look at that guy. He's vandalizing state property mm. oh no wait he's just getting rid of that oh, bike you could go and out there like you said steal bikes and there's like what are you doing here oh i'm getting rid of this bike it doesn't belong on the street property oh well, that yeah. makes sense go ahead or sir. it's my bike it's my bike <laughs> and uh, i'm just taking the lock I, you know look at this uh, tell him a good story and yeah so that's lewis's advice for the <laughs> if you want a bike because uh, also i don't know i think maybe not so much i would imagine not so much in america but certain big european cities they're really bike Friendly, so there's yeah, a lot yeah, of bikes. I've actually read a lot. You about go that, uh, Amsterdam, uh, Helsinki. I used to just walk around at night and find like old bikes that were chained up, but like the wheels had been stolen and everything was gone. So I'd cut the lock on them, and then all of a sudden you've got a bike frame that you can, you know, rebuild again. And I thought I claim I'm doing a public service. The bike is clearly abandoned. It's missing wheels. It's broken. How about I just take it and fix it up? No one, yeah, no one has to know nothing. I was watching some big, uh, there was some actual European country that got really big into bicycling. And uh, the, they were showing that now the problem, and I can't remember what country it is, but it was like the biggest country for uh, bicycling. Mm. And they had a problem, like you say, where people for generations basically parked the bikes in these spots and never moved them. And there's these like streets where there's basically just piles of old bikes almost <laughs> locked to each other 
and they've just sat there forever because there's nowhere to park your bike. And then so mm. somebody just comes along and attaches their bike to it or somebody doesn't come back and get it if they want to throw away their bike. Uh, but, yeah, that's kind of crazy. It's just like, what do you do with all those bikes? Like you say, it's you definitely well something. Some... It sounds like something maybe Netherlands, they're very yeah, big. Yeah, it was something like that that, that and, was uh... really, really, like it was their infrastructure. Yeah. They're like, we're not dealing with cars. They just said, yeah, we're just going to make lot. have a bike culture. And, I think sometimes uh, they come. Works. Sometimes, sometimes the, the council puts up a note and says, look, in a month, in a month, we're going to come and take these bikes away. And then you still have, if you still had a problem, you could come downtown to the depot. You know, you <laughs> still got bike. three more months to come to the depot or something afterwards. So, um, yeah. Yeah, man. You gotta, well, that's just uh, oh, Gucci <sighs> stuff right there. Yeah. Two, well, two, two, two. Yeah, my mics. Yeah. My, I was worried for a moment. There we go. I'm showing everyone my little <laughs> mic with the switch. Yeah. Um, even, even when I shouldn't be paranoid and playing with it, I'm still paranoid. Yeah. Leave that switch alone. So, yeah, I mean, other than that, um, stuff's been pretty fun. I've got some things working on. Yeah, what do you mean working Obviously, on? Obviously, the first thing I was talking about was that LCD monitor. I did have a episode come out yesterday, mm. and I've already got the other episode done. And I don't want to really spoil anything. I did spoil it by showing some pictures of it. I've obviously got it really going or working. Mm. Uh, but kind of an interesting deal there. My first experience with uh, PVM that is not a CRT. Uh, now this one is the direct uh, right like the after the one. PVMs. Yeah, yeah right after the, the PVMs one. abandons CRT technology and moves into that. What year is it? Do you know? Early LCDs. Oh man, I can't. Now that you asked me that, I can't. Be about two thousand six, I would imagine. It's somewhere around there, but there's a couple different monitor models of it, and it's kind of funny. I was like, I got done with my first video, and then I was like, well, I'm gonna see just if anybody's even made any real content on the 14 inch pvm lcd monitor and i was so I was googling it and you know getting on youtube i did find one uh funny video kind of from a guy and it was about a 1410 which i um, guess is around the same just maybe a little bit different model mm -hmm. of it and so he's like oh, i got this monitor mm -hmm. and it, his was like worse beat up than even mine is and he got it apart, and he's like, oh, the caps are bad. And I was laughing. It's the same caps that were bad <laughs> in mine. So I'm like, oh, well, that at least proves this is a consistent problem. So if anybody gets it and doesn't power on, change mm. these, at least change these three capacitors that I show. And what it, were the, what, do you it. know what those capacitors were related to? What it's a power, well, so the power supply, you know, the power comes into the power supply, and then the main, whatever, AC 120 in America, and then I think it'd probably go up to 240, but then the power supply, you know, breaks that off into usable DC current mm -hmm. through its process of, uh, you know, stepping it down and, and, and also uh, uses the capacitors to filter it, and that way, you got one, you know, in my area, you got 110 to 120 volts AC coming into it. And then at the end of the DC power supply, you've got like nine volts, five volts and 12 volts and grounds going out into the monitor so it can power all the um, mm. things that, in it. Because, again, this is different. It doesn't have the high voltage path yeah. that goes from there to like the flyback and into the neck where you've got a lot more higher current. So it's not like that. Uh, but what happens is it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I, and I do go through this as to why this particular particular design seems to fail in the same way it does. I mean, the long, the long story short is there's, it's funny, this PVM has three fans in it, which CRTs didn't have any fans in them, right? Sure, yeah. But this one has three fans in it. And for some reason, they didn't put a fan over this section. So mm -hmm. there's a cluster of seven capacitors right next to three or four transistors on some big heat sinks, a lot of heat in that area. And... The, the caps they use are high quality caps so i'm not i'm not quite certain that it's not something where there's an actual design flaw in it hmm. right yeah. because if you're using high quality capacitors i don't think they should fail at that quick of a rate on something True. that's an lcd screen i'm sure probably wasn't used nearly as much as a uh, pvm that was a crt hmm. so i'm thinking that there's also hmm. a design issue there where um since those fail I'm betting Sony probably had to make a bulletin about it. I don't know because I don't have it, but it mm. it seems rather interesting that it's it's uh, common. But it's anyway, this guy's mod, video, man. yeah, so there's fans mod. fans oh, in there. Yeah. Um, but this guy's video on his 1410, it was hilarious because at the end of it, uh, he's like, "All right, I got it running. Let's plug up some video games and see how it looks." And he plugs in. And he's like, oh, this just looks like a giant smeared turd. He just puts it on composite. 
and it's just i mean it looks hideous in his video and and then he's like i know what to do with this and it's end of his video he goes and just throws it in the trash <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh man, that's actually kind of funny. It's like a three-minute video. Hope you got the views video. to make up for it, three mate. Video, like... Three-minute video. So uh, in my, I'll put a link to it, you know, in my in my upcoming second because I reference it while I'm working on it about mm. just kind of the story on it. And uh, monitor. so it's kind of funny. And uh, is yeah, so he does like, oh, this thing belongs in the trash. But what I was seeing there is just like it looked like a smudgy turd. And then I, I was like, oh my gosh. So I look at a couple <laughs> other people's videos on it, and it's all just like smudgy turdness. And I'm like, what is, what are these, what are they doing? And I'm looking, and I don't think that it, I could find a single video where somebody was actually putting RGB in it. They were like, this is how you convert something to crappy composite and then put it in. And I'm like, what, what in the world? That's so, why it looks like a turd because you're running composite into an the LCD. Thing. And then I was yeah. I'm like, I can't rely on it. So I was like, this is good. This is good. No information. Let's go and try to make this as right as possible for this poor LCD. <laughs> But anyway, that's uh, so that you just were a funny okay. So reference. let's go through the monitor then. Yeah. So I mean, and with all uh, with all the things, I know I keep talking about it. I swear, I swear it's coming. I don't know when, but I do have my video about the OLED PVM that I would like to contrast and compare uh, to your one. I'm trying to just make it a short one and get it out there because, as you said, not much info out there about these. Maybe someone with no. some early LCDs, um, because I mean, once you get past that sort of first LCD generation, um, definitely once you hit the OLEDs for sure, once you hit about 2010, 2011, when the OLEDs kicked in, I mean, then you've that monitor is still relevant today. Yeah. So I understand why there's not a lot of them floating around and there's, there's Retro Lou or Retro Steve or whoever re reviewing it because it's not something that's cheap and crossing our paths, which is like most other things. Right. So tell us about this monitor. It's one of the first ones we think uh what inputs does it have on the back well it actually has a lot of inputs and that's the best and most saving uh whatever you want to say part about it because mm -hmm. even if you're looking at a consumer grade television and again this is just more of a uh, american thing we don't have any rgb inputs like just straight rgbs that's the good thing about this monitor is it definitely has rgbs uh, inputs on it just like a normal PVM it's got two uh, connections for composite video and one you can do is S video it's got loops through that uses oh. BNC adapters the panel looks almost uh, just like a panel you'd see on like a 20 L2 or something for an L2 PVM that's a CRT the little input board a mm -hmm. at least when you're looking at it with the shell off uh, it's obviously thinner uh, it's not a very thin LCD, though. It's still yeah. five inches thick for a 14-inch monitor. Uh, you know, it's... It, I, I struggle to see the... Um, if I, this is a funny, it's, this is maybe I, I don't again, I don't want to spoil too much on it, because when when this second video comes out, you'll see it. And then I do plan after that to even make a third video where it's like shootout time, where it's here's the C, here's a PVM and here's this uh, or here's the LCD and here's the CRT right next to it. Let's see how it looks, you know, film it. Let's see what the comp comparison is that way. Mm -hmm. And, I think that's uh, a great, that's a good idea because people will say, because you, you, if I understood what you're saying, you're going to compare almost the best PVM, you know, the last ones, the late model to the first LCD. And I know that's like a little bit apples to oranges, but that's also the reality that was going on around 2006. That is apples to oranges, yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's still what people were facing. Like there was no doubt people in broadcast who were like, yep, getting our new flat screens. And then what have we got? 480i into oh, what we and, now and no, yeah. That's the thing. It's like yeah. I would have been pissed off if I was like a Sony sales guy. And you're like, dude, these guys in this production studio love these CRTs the way they look. They've been working on them their whole life. And you're trying to get me to go in with this new technology. It's this LCD screen. And, and then that's what I mean. Like, I want to put it side by side so you could be like, if you're like in the sales pitch meeting, I bet a bunch of guys are going to go, yeah, you come back to me in a couple of years when you figure this, <laughs> this out. Right. Right? Because it's like that. And maybe that's why that LCD era on the dates mm -hmm. probably so low, and they love to get over the against the OLED when it was available. 
because I just don't see it, man. I just don't see that sliver of time where the LCD was in use that it, to me, is going to look as good um, as the CRT did that were out then. Because, again, you're talking about the CRTs at the end of its life where mm. the best of the CRT would have been available at some point in the last few years, and you've got one of those, and then you're going to set up this thing next to it. It's brand new. Well, it gave and me then, an idea when you were talking about it that I need to talk to a couple of blokes that I know who would have been in professional video stuff around that time. I know they would have been dealing. One of the, one of them was one of the guys I got my PVM CRT from, the 14 inch. I got to talk to a couple of them and say, just ask, what did you feel in 2006 when this was happening? How did that go for you? I think that'd be a, a fascinating talk. Um, who knows? Maybe yeah. something we can get on the show as well. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this this is still the i <laughs> I'll, I'll say this about it <laughs> probably the biggest disappointment to me on the thing was to find out that it still was only standard definition mm. and so if you're listening to the podcast today congratulations you're getting a little bit of a sneak peek that i haven't really mentioned now if you've probably worked with this monitor or know anything about it read on it you may know that already, that it's just standard def. 480i. You're yeah, you're literally only getting 240p and 480i out of it. Mm -hmm. So, I because I, that was the first thing, is like, all right, it's working. It's going good. I want to try, you know, my Xbox just in 480p. I went 480i, and 480p, nothing. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh. So, yeah, it's not... Um, I struggle. I struggle to find the exact application for it. Right. Uh, unless... Did you test 240p? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's and footage of test for 240p okay. and and it, through like, RGBS in that video. And right. then I switched it over to component. Because I haven't watched it yet. There we go. No, <laughs> no, no, no. This is, it's okay. That hasn't even out yet. That, oh, okay. That, that this one, hasn't, right. I just finished, <laughs> I just finished this video yesterday, which mm. that's a secret to me on how I do my YouTube videos. Like, Ooh, too, tell us what? Is, well, so, um, you know, when you're making YouTube videos, you never have any time to like sit back and watch. It almost feels like you never have any time to sit back, re like relax when your release comes out and enjoy mm. whether it's viewed and, and, and liked or whatever uh, received at all by your audience. I don't know about you, but YouTube just feels like something like you get the project done and all that build up is great. And then you release it. And if you just release it, you know, it's almost like, oh, my gosh after an hour later you think oh my goodness what am i doing next right or like what's mm -hmm. the next thing and i hate to say that it kind of sounds like i'm just doing it to, for the sake of doing it but it's not it's like He's the it's when you get beast. in your flow it's literally what you're thinking about and so i was like i have no time to really sit back and enjoy the release of this video mm -hmm. so my rule now is to always be like okay the video that i'm getting out now i i need to have at least a follow-up video shot edited and rendered onto my desktop i don't have to have the video title i mean i don't okay. it's not going to be all the way done but i want to have that video done so that i could sit there and watch and try and i've been trying to do that more over the last six months so that you know, it gives me a little more time to kind of react to the comments on the video when it's fresh and uh you know, it, it, it helps you because you can understand kind of the direction of your channel going. But anyway, so you're trying to stay one ahead. Is that the idea? A that little you're bit. To... Well, it, okay. man, and it does. It, it 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 feels a little bit better when you're one ahead. And then mm -hmm. somebody's like, oh, well, I can't wait to see what happens with this thing. And you're like, yeah, don't worry. You'll be you'll be good. It's going to be, you know, it's like this one. It's like I got the first episode out because the second one was shot, edited and finished. And then I released this one. And then mm -hmm. that next one will be out in three or four days. But it's uh that's kind of the process there that i go through on that and i don't even remember why i got off on that tangent. i like the two-part idea that's actually given me an idea as well like because i always look at should it be over 10 minutes how much should it be how much detail i'm like oh maybe two videos you know a shorter yeah. one or maybe a more technical longer one like a shorter concise summary one where you know you get the details and then there's the longer free-flowing one where you're just blah 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 talking about it Do you like the five minutes watch the 20 minute version or it's interesting it's, uh, i see where you're yeah. going with that there's an um so yeah it, I, I it's funny i was trying to make shorter videos and i did for a little while but then like you say you get to the point where you're like well i didn't put enough in that and i don't really so it's like a mix do you make a 30 minute video every time or it's like this one do i make an entire 40 minute video 
about repairing this LCD or can I break it down into two 20 minute videos, make them a little bit more, uh, you know, it's, it's much easier to sit through. Definitely. That's why, uh, and it's a better benefit to me as a creator to be able to split that down into two very watchable episodes and then make them to where like somebody could either come across both of them. And even if you just come across one, you don't really have to watch the other one almost to understand where you're at. It's like these are their own entity, yet they are part of something. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go back and watch like a full hour on it, you could watch three videos or, you know, this section has the points that you're looking for on it. Hmm, so it's good. uh it, it's there's always that idea too um but no i don't even that's that's just you know youtuber lingo there i'm sure a lot of other people that i know that that's the funny thing is you get into youtube and the youtube community uh, a lot of people on here are just like us other creators so i'm sure a lot of other people have their own methods that's just always uh been something that uh, it, it i i will say it just it, it's helped me a little bit it relieves the pressure of being worried about knowing what's next. how to, to put out. So I, I think re, like when I originally first started to record podcasts live in person years ago, I mean, they were like two hours, two and a half hours and people are like, Oh, they're so long. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a podcast. Just hit pause and come yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, what are you okay. talking about? Joe's shows like four hours every day. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so, but now over time I've sort of, understood that there's maybe a react like just looked at myself and went if i'm getting into something new do i pick up something at two and a half or do i go for an hour especially with the videos again have i got enough for 20 minutes do i make smaller so i over time i've, I've brought that down i just want to make something that's manageable people could listen to um i guess also when we're doing th this podcast is a weekly one and that's a little i like that idea that it's uh just an hour in length or so like because the when I was doing those long ones, they're really good when it's like that, like the original style you and I did. Yeah, Imagine if yeah. it was you and me sitting around with a few beers. I mean, that's easily hours upon hours right there, right? So different styles, right? And you can't like we can't you and I couldn't just sit around. Uh, well, we could, but <laughs> I don't think people would sit there and want to just have us at least not the beginning of this show. Just you and I sitting around talking for three hours every week, and that would really tax us. I feel like too, it's a lot just of between time, the yeah. two of us. But the one hour ish is great, at least for right now. I feel like it really is working. Uh, but that's that's the game. The game we play. I feel like though this this podcast is it's doing well, going right direction, and uh, it's I'm nice. Excited. Yeah, we, I was looking at the the responses from the last one we did with Thomas Dady. Uh, that's great. That's almost you know over a thousand views right now for an obscure what well, you might think is obscure CRT topics, and for a video that's an hour as well. So. That's another factor that when I'm looking at uh, our podcast numbers, it, I think these long ones are treated differently in the, the algorithm. Maybe Bob's probably got opinions on this. He's put out a lot of short <laughs> yeah. ones and now a lot of long ones, how they get seen. So, Yeah, it's definitely different. Um, there's a guy, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with him. I've uh, It's funny, I actually sold him a BVM D24 like two or three years ago and he's got a really big youtube channel epos vox oh yeah yeah sure. okay and he does tons of tutorials on really good stuff like streaming mm. equipment obs studio and um he's also done some really awesome crt videos over the years yeah. if you want to check yeah, those he's, out he's like, the he's video guy really but he knows high, about monitors yeah, yeah really high production stuff and uh bob was like look man a couple years ago he's like look man this guy wants a d20 d24 have you got and i was like i happen to have one and he's really wants it and um, that was funny. It was literally probably six weeks into the pandemic. So it's yeah. really just like it hit and then everybody's locked down. I was like, well, I can drive it. He, he lives pretty close. So I was like, I can drive it to you, drop it off with you mm. and then drive back. And, um, but anyway, he does, I, I, it's, it's, it's interesting. I watch a lot of his stuff because I feel like he gets, he gets the whole YouTube game way better than most mm. people that I know. And he will mm. go through, I watched this great video he made at the beginning of the year about talking about what you should do with your YouTube channel. Should you make more than one? Should you concentrate? Like what, what actually happens to your audience when you live stream versus mm. uh, producing content versus a short versus the time length of your topic and it was very, very helpful. And I can't really go into, I mean, this is very deep, the stuff he was talking about with real hardcore, like 
an analytics and, and proof behind what he's saying. But for the most part, you can use all these different avenues. Uh, but there are things you should know. Like, for example, if you're live streaming on YouTube, those most of the time that live stream notification is 95% only going to be really sent to uh, your audience. And mm-hmm. that means your subscribers. So he says, once you start, so live streaming is not on YouTube is not a great Avenue to grow in new viewers just okay. by itself. Because again, that notification, and I noticed it myself, I'll watch some people's videos that I'm not um, subscribed to. And then I watch enough of them where they'll show up in just the regular feed, obviously not the Mm. subscription feed, but the regular feed. And it's not until like I started noticing where these people would have clips on their channel and it's clips from them doing a live stream. Mm. And you're like, I didn't even know they did live streams until you get on their channel. I mean, these are people with millions upon millions of subscribers, big channels. So there's definitely some truth to that part of it. And there's some other things. Um, uh, because I mean, obviously, so much stuff is changing right now um, with the way all this platform is going. So it's it's interesting. I think a lot of that stuff is really helpful. Uh, and like I said, I, I can't recommend or I recommend his his viewpoint on it because I feel like he's gotten it down to what like scientifically is right. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times people are concerned, right? What's this going to do? How does the algorithm? But he tries to put it, the algorithm is not just some, like, mindless, all-knowing AI that's going to make the decision on whether your video is going to be seen. It's, it's, mm-hmm. The algorithm is directly tied to the audience and their reaction to the video. Because you know what the algorithm wants? The algorithm doesn't care what the person's watching. The algorithm wants the person to stay on YouTube mm-hmm. as long as possible each sitting. So that means they're going to try to keep things... And that's why if you watch one topic, it'll say, here's another kind of close to that. Mm. That's good. That's good. So the more you're recommended and the more somebody clicks on that recommendation, the more that the algorithm moves that. And that's how it's like really working. It's like there really is a little bit of scientific thing. It's not just like, ah, but there is is science. in there. But that's the the how to my, my kind of issue with this whole thing is, though, is no doubt there is logic in the way that the algorithm works. I'm, I'm sure of that but it's that we need to determine that for ourselves and the small little bits and pieces are ever evolving. Absolutely. And that's like YouTube, obviously YouTube will never publish, hey, this is how our algorithm works. If you do this, this, and this, this is going to promote you here. There's, There's a weird part of this whole game that it's, there's, creators like yourself and myself and all around the world thousands probably i don't know hundreds of thousands oh, who man, knows there's millions of them yeah millions, millions of and us, we're all us, I guess just say. guessing now epos vox is doing a scientific guess he's got some data he's look i've worked out this bit and this bit and that bit and ultimately we're all just guessing what the algorithm does and you like you say the algorithm isn't god it was programmed by a person and there are people out there who know how it works and i bet that they are sitting there next to 11 herbs and spices and the recipe for Coke, and they're all locked down. <laughs> they're not going to tell us, though, right? Who's, no, if they're not going to tell. No. Hey, if, you, if you knew the truth, and it was that easy, where it's just like, well, just do this, and then you're not going to tell anybody. Why? I mean, it, it, right? Uh, you can't tell. Most, You've I mean, got this. Imagine I'm not knowing saying that. that. I'm not saying that like everybody's going to be that way, because eventually somebody will be like, oh, look, this is what broke the algorithm. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, if you're in that play position, uh, a lot of people are just like, mm, mm, I don't know how it works. It just works for me, right? right? So like, there's almost there's almost a stupidity level uh, that that's flown into it. So, uh, but it, I, I just wanted to like, I know we went on a ten minute shout out to Epus Vox, which is fine. <laughs> just you know, I think that that he has a good understanding of it that I've seen. Um, in comparison, because outside of that, like you say, it is a lot of guessing and unknown and, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and so it's it's like and, and then obviously YouTube's always every app's always changing sure. things to it. And if so, but I think that probably is a good time to jump over something. A little yeah, bit, let's go. We got a, a few more different topic. To let's jump on. Go through. Let's jump on the Mr. and the Mr. Cade for a minute. And sure. uh, 
So you've been working. We know you've got the Mysticade. We know you've got the old Neo Geo cabinet. Yes. That, uh, oh, there it is. Yes. Yeah, so I right was there. like, why is this? Why is this dude pointing to his head? I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> right there. And then there's, there's the my lovely 3D printer and my lovely furnace. Uh, but yeah, so I've got obviously the Mr. Cade. It's awesome. Mm. And one of the things that I just did uh, this weekend was print this lovely mounting bracket. And the I just wanted it because I didn't like the fact that my Mr. Cade was just sitting like this. It sits you know, there, is it? Just yeah, sits okay. there, plugged in. It's not in any trouble, but I just was like, man, I want something at least to go mm. under it. it. Looks nice. And I first printed a single case, uh, just bottom, you know, for this yeah. half. And then I, right after that, I found this design. It hadn't been downloaded very much, so um, I just thought I'd show it. It's on Thingiverse, and if you just type in Mr. Cade mount, it will show up. So uh, it took five it hours to nice. print. It, it, yeah. it works nice. They said the guy who made it said that he was working on a top for it. But I will tell you that after I I tweeted uh, I tweeted pictures of this, and Mister Addons uh, replied, told me that he had a case, which doesn't surprise me because he makes that awesome metal case. Uh, mm. He has a case planned of some sort for this, and that's being designed and put together. So I'm excited to see that too. But in the meantime, if you do have a 3D printer that's capable. Mm. then you can print that for just uh, five hours worth of print time. So was... overall, uh, like how to say, because I've never used the 3D printer. I don't have one. It's a whole new world to me. Oh, man, it but is. But you basically, I mean, you said you had to make some some changes to your printer, but it you were able to do this, that sort of thing, after only a couple of weeks of using it. It's not like you've got a million yeah. like failed prototypes hanging around. Like They're kind of just coming out kind of properly now. Is that right? Yeah, it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, I mean, it's an intense learning curve, almost like anything else. It's not something you really just don't go put. First off, if you get a good 3D printer, mm. it's going to come in a box that's going to take you two hours to put it together. <laughs> Even oh. like, I mean, I, that's an expensive one, uh, not an expensive, expensive one, but over 250 bucks or US just for the uh, printer itself. So it did, it took me two hours to put it together. Mm. And then... You've got all these different points to cal, you know, three or four things to calibrate, mm -hmm. and then the biggest problem is trying to figure out how to get that little nozzle head uh, right at the right height, where it's you know almost scraping your print flat print bed, hmm. because if it doesn't, then the stuff just strings and it won't you know it won't stick good, and mm -hmm. the bed has to be completely level, which you do by hand with springs and things. And if it's not level and the surface isn't level, then half the prints don't work right. Then you've got all this other weird stuff I'm learning about where you've got these curling effects that happen on the end of prints where like one corner will get too hot and it starts to curl up when it's supposed mm -hmm. to be. There's actually one of the posts did it a very little bit on this. And it's not it's not like a huge turn off or anything. But do you see how that is that post looks good, right? That looks Move really it good. to the center a little bit. You've just. Okay. Oh wait, actually, maybe Sorry. I can make you. Make this you... post is the one that's curling a little bit. Do you see? Oh, okay, how yeah, it's a little not... bit. Yeah, <laughs> it, like it curls up. Well, it should be mm. flat, but it does. It curls up a little bit from. Uh, okay. the, see how the other side is flat. That's it's mm. supposed to be designed like that. So mm -hmm. it just ha heats and contracts. So there's definitely weird tricks I'm still trying to learn about how to make it stick more. I guess but if it's you very handy. Screwed uh, that in it, right uh, now, it'd be all right. Like if you just oh, screwed yeah, it yeah, in yeah. gently, it's you not, can screw it into the wood, no, it would still it, work. It would still work, and it's not like it's out that much, but it's it, it's like if you're looking for something that you wanted to produce, hmm. that you wanted to sell, those are the kind of things you have to obviously figure out how to mitigate. Um but yeah, yeah I mean, that's a cool little setup, and I nice. did have some Fun. Uh, so are you going to screw it in? Are, are you going to screw oh, that one uh, into the... Nah, I just set how? it on there because I have okay. to take it out all the time to update it. Mm -hmm. I was kind of telling you that. I, I take it out to run all the updates and it, I take the whole mister. I just unplug it from the machine, pull it out here. Right, we're going to go up. through this because yeah, you you've dope. got the, the analog out, but the I, it's something in your Mr. I and I settings. Maybe I'm sure FB, it is. FB setting. I think I'm so scared like about those settings though after I crashed the thing the first time I... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah all right well, oh no i'm just kidding but it's uh yeah so i i haven't uh, you know that's i think that's why people also maybe um put some kind of little lcd screen next to their mr setup that mm. laser bear sells so you can have both 
or directly out straight from yeah, it. But I've you um, can safely. Who was? Uh, oh, that's right. It was what uh, Mr. Add-ons and I think Bob was talking about it this week that they did the those tests as oh, to yeah. how, what is the best storage medium for your your ROM files and it's SD card. But it turned well it turns out that over a great um, network LAN. disc yeah. over the LAN uh, is is really nice. And I was trying something like that this week. Oh, really? As well and. Um, what I, once I got it all set up, I got the cable in and I could do a remote. Uh, I used FTP to, I just FTP into it or something. And then I was, I'm using uh, the update script on my VGA monitor. So I am using it via the uh, okay. analog out. So all that's kind of possible. There is a bit of screwing around with those settings there, but we'll get through that. But I, yeah. you don't definitely, I reckon if you, for you maybe, if you could just uh, run a network cable into the back of it, um, as I know, you said you want to set up a network when you get that. Yeah, I do. On. Cause I got that. I mean, I've got the closet like right behind it and that would be okay. really cool. Like it's a closet that would be nice to set up something like that, uh, for that purpose. Exactly. Mm. I think that would be really fun to have. I mean, cause also you could have an, an, an not worry about messing. I think that's the most important thing is not worrying about messing with basically ejecting this card every time yeah, 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 to do yeah. things with it. Cause some things you can't do through the mister. You have to take the card out and do that. And it would be great to just not even mess. Like, you know, you do as little as possible with that and to go into just your external server and, you know, just pile on data in there and games and programs, whatever you want to do that the mister eventually can do. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that's what, and what Bob was talking about in yeah. the last video, that they're trying to, there's this idea that what if you could have one uh, like networked drive in your house and then your mister is using those same ROMs and your whatever other emulation unit is also connecting into those on your computer is probably pulling those because right, if, yeah. if, you're, if you're huge retro nerds like us, you're probably playing on a number of different devices in any given moment. Off. Now the Wii U is yeah. connected, great. I'll play some retro games on the Wii U. Um, yeah, I'm a bit, I think I'm pretty good with everything on the SD card, but I had it here and it was seemed to be, the, I was a bit worried as well. I was doing it five times an hour or something, <laughs> always pulling it in and out, in and out. I'm like, ah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, you've, uh, had reminiscent, reminiscent of your first sexual experience there. <laughs> yeah, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> oh, oh, nothing's yeah, happening. Pull, pull out before it's too late. Ugh. You know, just kidding. That's pretty, pretty dirty joke. It's um, all right. I, we, it reminds me of, um, oh God, look, if anyone from Australia is, if anyone from my generation from Australia is watching this podcast, I, it reminds me of a story. They tried to give us sex education in high school. <laughs> they tried. And it used to be, uh, definitely, if you were went to school in New South Wales, you know this, the life education semi-trailer. And it used to be, like, teachers can't teach you about this. Your parents certainly can't fucking tell you. So it would be like this semi-trailer that would travel around. It would park in oh. your school. And then you would all, as a class, kind of go in. And there was like a classroom in there. And this is where they would teach you about bad things, about sexual health things, about sexuality things. And there was an animatronic giraffe. That was the main kind of thing. So the, the, the like, animatronic like the giraffe. Toys R Us mascot? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because we don't have Toys R Us in Australia, but at least not then. So we didn't know that that was the Toys R Us giraffe so was given us. And it would say, and I just have this really distinct memory of, in the, it was in a, like a, not in a high school, uh, no, we call it primary school, uh, maybe a middle school. I don't know what you call it in America. And we all rolled in there and it was sex education class. And it was a video and there were the like meant to be these two high school kids, and it was meant to be like the guy pressuring the girl, like "Come on, baby, come on, baby, let's let's do it." She's like, "I don't know, I don't know if I want to do it." <laughs> and in the school education video, I remember distinctly the guy says, "Come on, baby, let's do it. I'll pull it out before I come." And we didn't know what the hell this guy's talking about. What? We're little kids. What does that mean? What is he Where's talking about? Where's it going? About? Where's it go? Oh, and even the, oh. so. Oh. That's shouts, the worst. shouts to anyone who went into the weird that, band of sexual education awesome. growing up in Australia. I can give you I can give you the American version. Okay. So yeah, this would have been, I don't know, man. This is like middle school age before high school, like sixth or seventh grade, I want to say. And again, this is like I remember I was I mean, I'm not gonna just try to be like a complete weirdo, but I know at this point I'd never even like whacked off. So I was like, <laughs> sure. I don't even know what this shit is. Like, I'm not, I mean, this is, again, there's like, back when I was a kid, 
like you would if you if you were one of the cool kids they would give you basically a map to go out in the woods where you could dig up a time capsule that was loaded with playboys and that was like, really and that was like you better leave it there or we're gonna kick your ass you know <laughs> so you couldn't that was like the only act that was like your click your easiest access to anything would have been something like that but anyway Oh, dude, that's great. No, no, wait. I want to, I'm letting you finish that story because I want to know yeah. more about it. Okay. So first of all, we have to, I mean, set the scene for maybe our younger viewers. There's no porn. There's no, no way no. to get access to that. Well, there is. The, that, there well, is. There but you're talking about, this is why, uh, you know, like you heard of Larry Flint, or like sure. Hustler. Hustler. You know, hustler. that's, yeah, yeah. so this is like, you know, Playboy and Hustler and that's it. And then some other really dirty mags that you're like, mm. ooh. You know, so maybe someone's got their hand on a VHS somehow. Oh yeah, Hustler, in the VHS Playboy. tapes, dude. Dude, VHS tapes that came in those cases that were like three times bigger than a VHS. Tape. Really, the I didn't know biggest, that. Why? What yes, was that? Yeah, I have no idea. So yeah, you always have growing up. There's some in America. There's always going to be one of your friends that just becomes a closet pervert and is like <laughs> addicted to this stuff. And I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> it's probably much more you know less of a deal now because. It's so prevalent, and there's so much of it, and it's so easy to get. I mean, back in the day when it's hard mm. to get, you get somebody who's like, oh, yeah, I'm into this. And, like, one of my best friends, it's like you go over and spend the night at his house, and then after a couple times, he's like, let me show you something. And he pulls out the freaking 40-year-old virgin, virgin box, which is filled with these tapes, right? And you're like, <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you, you weirdo? So he, uh, you know, you start talking to him, and in – He's like, yeah, uh, I got a fake ID just so I can go get porn tapes, right? And this was like, it's like 15, 16 year old kid. Yeah. And he's like, don't worry, I've been going to this one shop enough times that we could just walk in and, and they don't even card you till you buy something. And I was like, okay. So he's like, come on, let's all go down to the shop one day. And we're like, all right. <laughs> sure, we got nothing buddy. to do. We're like, yeah, we'll go down there. And, uh, yeah, then you walk in, and, I mean, this is my first experience with something like this hardcore. And uh, this would have been the, the late 90s, and it would have been, yeah, you go in, and it's like block, but a gr grungy blockbuster video with all kinds of creepy, creepy old men, like, trying to keep to themselves, and all these teenage kids come in there. And, yeah, because we don't know what, like, you, like, you're like, look at that dude. He looks kind of creepy. And then you're like, holy shit, look at the porn he's looking at. Stay away. <laughs> Anyway, we go into this store, you know, that that's when you see these they're literally they're bigger than like three DO boxes, man. Really? I gotta look this up. Right. Uh and so then uh, like then like yeah, he's got of course, like I said, this the collection of and he finally gets married and dumps it off to somebody. But I just remember that vividly. He was the one who had all that and then before that he had access, you know, to the to the to the 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 uh hidden collection mm -hmm. in the woods and this is not fiction this is actually true so in the town that i uh, grew up in in tennessee there is it's a it's a lake in that area a big lake so there's a lot of people who live on the lake a lot of people go boating and when you have that um the in tennessee this is not the way it is in everywhere but in tennessee there's a thing called the corps of engineers which is a government agency and they own all the shoreline, okay? So even if you own a lake house, you technically do not own like the first, I don't know, 10 feet of shore. Sure. They own it and they manage it. They have rules for it. You own everything beyond that. You have to get permits to do anything on that. But the reason I'm telling you that is they own portions of the lake that they turn into public hubs where you go down and you launch your boat. If you just own a boat, you don't live on the lake. This is a parking lot. It's wooded lake mm, here. Sure. And you've got a boat ramp. You go drop your boat in, go out and boat. Well, this was the point. Everybody would go. When I was a kid, you'd get one person to go out there. And this was in, again, biking area from where we lived. Mm. And if you would go out, the woods out there would just be loaded with stuff. Like, <laughs> stuff. It was, again, it was like the haunted woods. You just, uh, everybody for 20 years was hiding things out there that they didn't want to get caught. And so, yeah, there's the, that stash. Anytime... If, Hey, this was another one. If you got, mm -hmm. if you're underage and you get a bunch of beer and mm -hmm. you don't know, I mean, your parents aren't going to let you keep it in the refrigerator. <laughs> used to go out and hide it in the woods, <laughs> hide literally cases of beer in the woods because you're like, all right, we're all going to get out. We're going to go get, you know, Bill, uh, B Billy Joe's dad's going to let him take the pontoon boat out. We're going to need some beer. 
And so, so the one kid that had the access to beer would go buy all the beer, and then we'd have to spend literally a day with him going and picking up beer for 200, you know, oh. kids. And then go take it, hide it in the woods all a day before you go out and party on the lake just in hopes that nobody would wander in the woods and find I was gonna you say, know, you're not $200 worth it. of beer. And you're not digging it, though. It's not like buried no, no, treasure no. right you're, now. But you, okay. you know, it's, it's usually lots of down, um, you know, there's good spots. Some stuff was buried, but <laughs> some stuff, no. You was just like cover it. And so there was some stuff it. in the forest that was like, uh, yeah. old, like being there for a while. It was this weird, you know, some sort of weird collection as you're walking through. But it was also <laughs> you were used as a temporary storage space, absolutely, as well for, for adolescents. Like that. I um, I think that, you know what? Now that we're getting back into this memory, and we're about an hour in, so fuck it, we could talk about porn mags more. <laughs> I suspect that my friends and I may have hit a porn mag in the the well, the bush. We call it the bush, the forest. Uh, around we lived in a very rural area so there was lots around i suspect we may have done that once um because the way that um i was a very con- very conservative upbringing so i really i would never have dreamed of walking into an, an adult store when i was underage <laughs> or something like that no matter who it would have been but i remember the way that we did it and this way that we got mags they weren't playboy that would be like oh my god you got a playboy oh my god we got we call them in, in australia like people magazine or the picture and it's like the english have this as well you see a few boobs uh lads magazines uh, i guess it's not like porno but there's still a lot of kind of still naked women in there but kind of lads magazines blokes magazines and what the local news agent would do Back in the day, I mean, they sh- would get shipped a whole bunch of magazines. And if those magazines didn't sell, they didn't have to ship them all back to the supplier. All they had to do was clip out part of the front cover to prove that they still had that. And then I think they sent those back and the rest could be thrown out. So we learned that those mags were all thrown out into the bins out the back of the news agency. And you had to kind of sneak around the corner and make sure no one was looking and run in. And, and you had to park your bike around the corner, but you want to make sure no one pinches your bike. So it's kind of got to still be in view. And then, yeah, you'd open up the bin and do a little dumpster diving. And that's the only place that... And I think maybe I'd... I think I'd taken a picture. Again, I'm like 14. I don't know. Like, I think I got a magazine, realized... Well, now I have it. What can I do with it? I can't take it at home. Yeah. Maybe once I tried to store in the forest, but it's wet. <laughs> it's I haven't a got advanced. It's a, it's a magazine. How's that going to get rain. stored? I think I'd snipped out a picture and I could keep that with me. And I was like, that's something that was hideable at home in a drawer or something. But a whole magazine is no chance that I would bring that anywhere near my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's some funny stuff. I. I the the links you went to back then just to see it you didn't even know what it yeah. was pretty much back then you're just like let's let's do that it's uh my how culture has changed you just have so much easy access to everything now and but i went it, to it when you said about the, the vhs covers i searched vhs porn cover and i really i didn't see what i was looking for oh, but i see well you can imagine what i'm seeing probably but. that's probably yes. one of those things that you shouldn't uh you shouldn't search for <laughs> Oh yeah, Google's telling me like surf sage is on. Do you want the surf sage? Oh, Google's freaking out. Doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah, I'm like, oh. wait till you see your new uh, your new round of uh, advertisements you're gonna get when you open your Facebook next time. It's gonna try to send you all kinds of stuff. Speaking of uh, speaking of funny, uh, yeah. So again, we're still. T- I mean, we're still kind of talking about the Mister a little bit. I guess I don't know. It's like, sure. I guess we can round yeah, out. We're almost so, at the but, hour. But, so what uh, do you got? I got one yeah, more thing fine. as well. But what well, do you? No, let's finish I was just gonna like. Mister say so yeah like this this is awesome and i'll tell you why (laughs) this is uh this is so my uh my wife loves to play one one video game and it's dr Uh mario okay so you can play dr mario uh two player on the super nintendo Mm -hmm. version of dr mario it's dr mario and tetris and they have these really killer two-player modes, you know, back and forth, old school. Well, you can hook that up and run it, you know, through the arcade, which it, it, it runs awesome, you know. So you're using the arcade hardware and it just needs one button or two buttons, so you're only flipping through. And uh, I'm trying to make sure she's not coming down here because I don't want to, I don't want to bust my 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 game I got working here. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, I just go through and I have these killer like. Uh, five rounds matches of this 
And okay. then if I just blow it, then I like every time I just blow it and let her win, I get laid afterwards. So it's like, <laughs> it's like I was like, strategic. I even, it's it's yeah. It's like you don't need to go to dinner anymore. You just go play some. And she's like, "Are you losing on purpose? No, no way, no way. No, what? It's <laughs> one time. It, this is like the only game. So like when I was when we first moved, I told you Oregon earlier. Mm-hmm. And she moved out there with me. Uh, she didn't have. Well, obviously we weren't from that area. She didn't have any, really know anybody, didn't have any job the first month or two. And we moved out there together and I was working like this stupid job I had with BASF chemicals was having me working like 70 hours a week of just mindless, unbelievable stuff. So I'd always be like out of my head. I'd come home and I'd be like, yeah, let's fire up that Xbox. She's like, yeah, let's play Dr. Mario. And then she would just like whip my ass. And then one day I was like, this is ridiculous. I bet you just stay home all day. and practice this while i'm out working and uh yeah so thankfully she didn't leave me for saying that but it was uh it's she still brings up oh remember how you like accused me of that you Back moved in the me day. out to, you moved That's me nice out three thousand from my home and you, you said i wasn't doing anything but practice it all day and i was like yeah <laughs> so yeah hey Gentleman. mr cade bringing relationships closer Doing what you can. <laughs> my, uh, we've been playing a bit of. Uh, I finally two weeks ago hooked up my Wii U. I redid the, uh, got the new custom firmware. Did all that. Like I refreshed it. Um, like we, I think we were talking about it last time. What happens when you hack a console, but then you leave it for two years and you come back and there's probably a newer hack and a better way to do it. And you could, so you got to refresh the hack. So I did all that. And we've been playing Breath of the Wild, and that's uh, we sit there and, and play together or watch the other person play it. So, okay, a bit of Dr. Mario. Because it's trying to find a... I guess with any two people, you got to find a game that both of you could enjoy. It's no fun if, like, someone dominates. Like, if we play a racing yeah. game... My girlfriend, she won't play racing games anymore. She's like, you always win. And I'm like, well, it's just because I play a lot. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> right. Great well, it. yeah, there's got to be something that both people mm. kind of like. But, so, yeah, that's... Uh, my that's final thing, it. just before we go, the, the last show oh, and yeah. tell that I've got was uh, this is the the GBS control, which I know you have one as well, Steve. Yes. This is my homeware hacked up version. Uh, so a, a GBS control is, if someone hasn't seen one of these before, it is a very cheap video converter board. You get them from AliExpress for about 20 bucks or 15 or something like that. And in its stock state, it's a terrible converter. It's got lag. It doesn't really do signals very well. But there's been uh, some custom firmware added to it. You can wire in an Arduino with some custom hacks, and it takes over, rewrites the soft, rewrites the board essentially, and turns it into a tremendous scaler and downscaler. And um, I need this because I'm hooking up my PlayStation 2 to a VGA monitor. While a lot of the games do output 480p, uh, there's not a good way to get that out, um, get component out. Uh, I guess because SCART, oh, I could use a SCART. I, get yeah, I don't like to. Use, I don't really like to use SCART for anything over. I know. I know that's you can, but I don't really like to use SCART for anything over analog myself. If I, so I understand what you're saying. You know, I suspect there's something there. I think there is. You can't something go 480p about, technically, but it can technically do it. But it's like not part of the spec or not really yeah, originally so. how it was meant to be used scott definitely scott's definitely will have been created long before uh or rgbs was created long before people were thinking about doing the 480p in regular monitors um so yeah i try to as well not i know you don't really i'm not going to get 480p over scott well you can but so anyway i'm running component in to the ps2 uh, and then nice vga out i can play it on my monitor and um, it works well for That's this good. is my thing. I'm I will hack it and spend twenty bucks to hack this thing rather than spending a hundred. Yeah, on some like the nice sucker, device. like I did. You, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, so you can the now. Yeah, the original, um, the original use for that cheap board inside there, which that's where mine is here. Okay, and uh, then GBS, uh, and control. then it's got this fancy, you know additional board that has programming with a SCART and HDMI out. So this one will do more. Mm-hmm. But again, I paid for this one. I didn't make it. I paid it. Uh, it looks got nice. somebody to make I mean, it for it's... me. So yeah, it looks real nice. Uh, but yeah, this the board was originally made as a cheap way to um, replace, you know, so you could replace the monitor inside your arcade cabinet with a crappy LCD monitor from the CRT so that's originally what this piece of hardware was made for, I believe, 
um, to begin with. So it would just basically, like you say, you could get VGA out of it, but you're still putting RGB basically in it because that's what the um, RGBS is what the monitors normally are using sure. in a arcade machine. So, um, yeah, it's funny. I, even before this project got started, I definitely found that board and was thinking about if it was a good board, but everybody knew it was just trash before um, the whole redesign was done of this thing. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah. it's a fun it's a fun thing. I mean, I, I say it's a fun thing. I haven't really had much time to use mine yet. And uh, I think get so. So for it. me, it was to to get it. I, I guess I'm essentially <laughs> using it as a component to RGBS transcoder right now. I've just got straight pass through uh, components coming in there. And uh, VGA right now is coming out of there. So it's more or less just as a straight transcoder. But I mean, I need, uh, we're going to get some postal service, I think, between you and me. I need you to yeah. print me a little case. That's I need right. to print a little case. I've just got a circuit board, takes five volts. Although it's interesting, my board says takes five to 12 volts. Uh, I'm not willing to stick 12 volts in this yet, but mine, yeah, mine says the same thing. And uh, I know that I got a note about the power supply sent to me. So I'm not really sure. Uh, but yeah, it's you don't want to send the wrong volts in there. I've done that before with a yeah. thing so and, and watched and clicked down... it on and watched it go with one of those. I wonder how it goes. Whether it's stepping down twelve. I mean, or I'm just looking. I at wonder if it just can take DC five to twelve. I don't know. Right, that's anything. what I think it is. Five like two twelve. Anything in between, it seems to be Six. okay with. So, right on, rock and roll. So, yeah. so um, I know there's a lot of information out there already about the GBS control. Uh, yeah. I'm using it as a pass through, uh, but I think next up I'm going to look into, I want to learn more about its downscaling uh, capabilities. I know that it has a very good downscaler in it because I'm seeing uh, online more and more people have the question, how do I get my console into a CRT monitor? And it's a straightforward question. It's a question we should be able to answer better, but there isn't a great solution for going HDMI or and also downscaling. We've got a HDMI out, out of your PS4 or whatever it is. You've got the latest Ketsui shoot 'em up on the PS4, and you want to play that on your CRT. And there isn't besides those uh, cheap AliExpress things with the variable lag. There's uh, you've got to spend um, well even at a hundred bucks. I think a hundred bucks is still probably the cheapest downscaler you can get. And okay, you can make it for twenty if you want to rig it up yourself but even this is not really i mean this is definitely not out of the box and it's hard no when it's not it's an, like it's it's again it's even more open source project almost you know mm. style it's and you're talking to people online and they're like look i'm just a regular person i want to play my xbox on a, an old monitor that i found how can i do it and i wish there was a better answer to give them than what the okay solder thing in program an arduino um so I wish there was sort of a, a better answer for that than the yeah. currently is. I think it's still a bit of a gap. That's what we need. What we need. Uh, we need Mike Chi to come and just give us the opposite of the RetroTink 5X, yeah. where it's the perfect and easiest thing that you plug an HDMI in and it spits out every other analog input you want. Which, as Ed, that was the idea for mine. I wanted it for uh, that purpose of just being able to go from something to like a Switch game or you know anything easily into a monitor and then even just to show off what it would look like on a crt and Corey from my life and gaming did like an a huge episode about that like an hour long episode of just trying different games so yeah there's there's really almost uh no more room on youtube for anything about it. <laughs> like yeah. what it can do at least right now because there's so much on there but um I still think, to me, this is, um, you know, it's got that intimidating looks homebrew good. hardware device, yeah. but it does look cool. But yeah, it's looks still, cool. it's not something that's for everybody because it's, 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 you know, it's just like anything in this hobby. A lot of this stuff requires, we were, we were trying to get ready for the podcast today and we were, you know, you broke your microphone <laughs> and... I was laughing. I was like, man, how many times do you just sit down and are thankful you have soldering equipment and know how to solder where if you didn't do that, you'd be like, man, I'm screwed. Now I got to go just buy a new microphone. Right? right. You wouldn't know what to do. So yeah, before we did the show, I was trying to, I'm using this other microphone with a switch that I pinched from my office 
And uh, I'd already tried to open it up, this whole thing, because I wanted to remove the switch. And I thought, well, maybe I can just, you know, get around it. But it's all kind of encased here and it was hard. But I had uh, pulled out one of the wires from inside of here. So, yeah, literally while you're waiting, whipped out the soldering iron. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I couldn't believe you hurt that uh, you told me you heard of your SM58 and I was laughing because when I bought my SM58 I watched Sure show me commercials about how they were running over it with like a, yeah, I believe a, a semi truck <laughs> and they're like oh it works perfectly you know, this is the until most terrible until you open them up until you until open, you them open up, it up yeah. then I know I was fucking with it the way it was unscrewed and, and so fair enough that was on me no, I'll, no, I'll, no. So I I'll wear that one I was like yeah. I was like, I thought these were indestructible. Well, at least it was pretty simple to fix. Yeah, at least right. It was, just the, it was just the wire had come off. So, All right, Steve. All we're right, at hour well, 10. Let's, so let's we're going to do uh, the next. Anyway, we'll work on that. So uh, when we're doing the next one. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Yeah, Again, just watching. shooting the shit, talking about uh, retro and CRTs. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.